big big punarong nirmde paraptan ata willem. That means welcome to our beautiful home, the lands of the two great bays, Nirm, Port Phillip Bay, and Marin, Western Port Bay. We're here at the Monash University campus, and it is about celebrating knowledge, yelenge. It's also about respect, respecting the country that you're now a part of. And it's also Jambana, how you will build a stronger community. How do we unite community within Monash University? And it's about respecting sacred ground or Papanata, Mother Earth. These are the guiding pillars of Warongi Bik, the law of the land. It's come with a purpose. Wamanjika, Marambikbik, Bunarong, Namdep, Barapten, Ata, Willem, Nungujin. Hello and welcome to the second Forum Times Content Lecture for this semester, which today will be given by Rachel O'Reilly and Tony Birch. My name is Helen Hughes. I'm speaking to you from my office on Monash University on the Caulfield campus, which is to say on the unceded lands of the Kulin nations to whose ancestors and elders I pay my respect. My office is also about 30 meters away from Womanjeka Jimbana, the indigenous research lab here on the Caulfield campus that leads significant decolonizing and indigenizing programs across many aspects of the MARTA faculty, including its curricula. Two of the lab's members, Associate Dean Indigenous Brian Martin and Associate Professor Brooke Garu Andrew gave the first Form Times content lecture of the year last week, titled More Than a Gulani, Indigenous Knowledge Systems, which was also the inaugural climate justice lecture here at MARTA. Tony and Rachel's discussion today again centers on climate justice and indigenous knowledge with a focus on the politics of extractivism. For those tuning in for the first time, Form Times content is a mix of 14 live and pre recorded events featuring the voices of renowned First Nations, Australian, and international artists, designers, architects, curators, and academics. The program is delivered every Wednesday lunchtime during the Monash Uni teaching semesters, both online and broadcast on the big screen at Monash Caulfield campus. Um, today, it's with great pleasure, not a little humility, that I introduce our guest speakers, the acclaimed writer and activist Tony Birch, whose many books and collected stories, such as Shadow Boxing, Ghost River, Blood, and more recently, The White Girl, you're all likely familiar with, as he's won numerous awards, including the Patrick White Literary Award in 2017. And um, our other guest is the artist and poet Rachel O'Reilly, originally from Gladstone, Queensland, and now based in the Netherlands, where she teaches at the Dye and in London, where she's a researcher at Goldsmiths, although I think she's actually sitting at her mother's house in Brisbane right now. Um, today, Tony and Rachel will be addressing the topic art, mind power, and the cultural work of climate justice. And they will be uh, reappearing on campus in a week's time on Monday, the 15th of March, where they will hold a discussion, uh, continue this discussion around the extraordinary Bunurong scar tree that has recently come into the care of Womanjeka Jimbana and the Monash Collection as part of uh, the Tree School exhibition in the Marta Gallery. Um, the format of this talk will be that Tony is going to respond to Rachel's uh, recent film Infractions made in 2019 um, for the first 20 minutes uh, and then Rachel will respond to Tony's comments and I should also let you know that um, the film itself will be made available online in about a week's time. Um, and this will be in conjunction with Rachel's contribution to the Tree Story project um, at Mater Gallery at Monash University. So uh, I will now hand over to Tony and Rachel. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone for, for, for listening. So um, I'm Tony Birch. Um, I'm coming to you from Carlton in Melbourne, which of course is on Wurundjeri land. So I want to pay my respects to Wurundjeri nation and all Wurundjeri people. Um, I also represent um, a group called the Melbourne School of Discontent, which are a group of what we call Fitzroy Blacks who started up a a virtual institute to combat some of the misinformation that we see being disseminated about 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, particularly in tertiary institutions. And we want to make sure that there's an alternative voice and a what we would consider an activist voice um, available to people who are interested in issues such as, but not exclusive to climate justice. So I've been asked to um, respond to um, Rachel's film. Um, I just want to say at the outset that it was, um, I think, a, a remarkable um, narrative for me to be able to watch because I've been working on climate justice and issues around climate change activism for many years now. And I found the film to be not only thought provoking, um, certainly it was a film that reiterated for me many of the key issues that I've been interested in, many of the concerns that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have to deal with and the incredible struggle that we face to um, get the rest of um, non-Aboriginal Australia to, to wake up to what needs to be done to protect country on this land, and of course, to protect country, sea country and land country and um, the air we breathe across the globe. So I just wanna talk about, I think, issues to me that um, that I wanna reflect on that, that really hit home in regard to, to what I've been thinking about now and talking to people about for many years. So I just wanna thank Rachel for the work that she's done. Um, I think it, it's a remarkable film. And the first thing I wanna say about the film, it, it gives so much privilege and precedent to, to the voices of um, Aboriginal people on country, which is often um, lacking or um, even in this space, often Aboriginal voices take sort of a secondary role to, to those who are you know, making these these documents in art, in film, et cetera. And I think Rachel's ability to ensure that um, our voices are privileged, I think is a testament to the quality and ethics of the, the film generally. Um, I want to start by talking about thinking. Um, the, the film opens with um, Professor, the esteemed Professor Irene Watson um, talking about several things, including the hypocrisy in relationship to um, the way that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people think about land and regard them their place in country as opposed to a European notion of the ex exploitation and extraction. But toward the end of the opening um, address or the opening um, conversation that um, Professor Watson um, talks about is that she simply talks about the need for thinking and that there is a lack of thinking within um, non-Indigenous um, Australia and non-Indigenous people globally in regard to our place on the planet and our place working with the planet as if we want to call ourselves nominally a global community. And I think this is the first and most um, telling issue that we have to deal with. We can talk about practical issues, we can talk about immediate political issues, but there is a, a clear absence of ethical thinking, of engaged thinking, of respectful thinking, um, of respect for the thinking and intellect of um, Indigenous peoples globally in relationship to how country and how land is seen. And for all the work that I've done in, in this space in regard to, to um, protection of country and climate justice, until we get a much more broad sense of how we defer to country, how we respect country and how we privilege country, the ability to protect the planet and the ability to protect ecologies is always going to remain a constant battle because once you start to um, weigh up what we might call capital gain or monetary gain or material gain against the values of country, the very fact of doing that is in itself that means that you are not giving um, privilege and um, authority to country. So we, we need to change our thinking. One of the things that um, Professor Watson's comments um, evoked in me was a reflection on some of the work I'd been reading for many years and some of the work that I've been writing about. So two other people I'd like to mention is the First Nations um, scholar on Turtle Island, Dwayne Donald. Um, Dwayne Donald is a writer and um, in Indigenous activist whose work I've been following for many years. And what he talks about in his work is something similar to Professor Watson's and that he says that what, you know, non, what the non-Indigenous world lacks and what, what he calls settler societies on Turtle Island lack is what he calls an ethical imagination. So it's not only to be imaginative in regard to how you see your, your place in a community, in a family, see your place on country, see your place in relationship to land and ecologies, what um, Dwayne Donald was talking about is that imagination also needs to have a very strong ethical basis. 
If we take those two provocations together, though, they offer up, I think, really exciting possibilities because what, what Donald would argue is by being imaginative and then grounding that in, in an ethics, in a sense of ethics, there are incredible possibilities, not only for Indigenous communities globally, but for one of his other interests is to get and enable Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities to work together effectively. So he sees that as not um, something that weighs our discussion down or not a burden. He actually sees that notion of thinking ethically and imaginatively together gives us great possibility and the potential to do to do something new and something exciting. And the other thing I think that links to this is a, an American philosopher whose work I've also followed, Elizabeth Minich. And Elizabeth Minich is really interested in the place of thinking in Western education. Now, she's not a scholar who is interested or concerned with how Indigenous thinking operates. She, she actually defers to that. She, she talks about the qualities inherent in Indigenous thinking. And what she would argue is that these qualities are lacking in Western discourse. And at a very practical level, I think that why I'm interested in Minich and why I think it relates to Rachel's film is that what Minich would say is that what we see globally today in relationship to, say, climate denialism or the exploitation of country, the extraction of country for capitalist gain, is that it comes with a, a deliberate, overt attempt to shut down thinking. So, in other words, climate deniers, deniers of colonial violence, denialism around the rights of Indigenous people, what that comes with is an attempt to shut down thinking, in other words, to ask us as global citizens or as citizens of a country to critically engage with these issues. So that I'll give you a very practical example of that. If you're a person who might be concerned about climate injustice, if you might be concerned about climate change, but like everyone, you're, you know, you're a busy person, you have family, you have work, you have all sorts of difficulties to deal with in your day-to-day -day life. Minich would argue if a climate denier who also happens to be a politician says, look, a lot of this stuff around climate change, it's, it's, it's not as problematic as we think. Um, the ability to extract um, gas from country, it's not a problematic issue. The science can do it. You don't have to worry about where we've got your back on this. It's, it's saying, defer your thinking to us. Let us look after this issue. So in other words, it's asking you not to think about these issues. And in doing that, it allows those who wish to exploit country, those who wish to um, exploit Aboriginal land in a Australia situation, it allows people to get away with, with, with crimes against country and people because it is promoting a, an absence of thinking in the community. So watching the film, the, the, the first thing I want to implore upon people, and particularly at an educational institution, is that you must engage with critical thinking. You must engage with imaginative thinking, and you must engage with thinking that listens to and privileges the voices of First Nations people, of Aboriginal people. The second um, issue that I want to talk about is in relationship to this is the, the shocking um, disempowerment that comes and the hypocrisy surrounding what is called native title, title legislation, which is discussed in the film, and to put that in opposition to what we might call a genuine sense of land rights and a belief in land rights. And to quote an activist friend of mine, Robbie Thorpe, when we talk about land rights, we're not talking about land rights for people, we're talking about the inherent rights of the land, so the inherent right of country. That is nothing like native title legislation. So that many of the Aboriginal people in this film who, who talk to country, who, who, who show us around country, they are not thinking about land rights in relationship to themselves. They're thinking about land rights in relationship to the inherent right of land as an entity. Um, Professor Watson talks about water itself as an autonomous entity. So what we understand as land rights is a belief, an absolute belief in the inherent right of country Whereas native title is a very restrictive governmental um, legislative um, form of um, rights, which in fact doesn't allow Aboriginal people to practice autonomous control and engagement with country. And one of the things that comes out in the film, which shows this to be such a hypocritical um, issue, is that when we listen to the people who are talking about land rights versus native title, what we know is this, is that 
you may have native title rights, and I'd use the term rights advisedly. And then if you as an Aboriginal community are engaged with government or a mining company wanting to protect your country against um, something like um, fracking, um, other forms of extraction from country, the very fact is that if you don't agree to a government decision to allow mining on your land, your native title rights can be revoked. So in other words, you are trapped in this situation as an Aboriginal community where you have to enter into some agreement with government, enter into some agreement with mining companies. And if you, re if you refuse that, which many communities do, you're actually the threat of even losing those threadbare rights under native title are held over your head. So there is no possibility for any community then to act in any sort of equitable way. Because basically what it is saying, what you're being told is if you don't agree with what we want to do, if you don't agree to allow us to exploit and extract from your country, we will take your right to country away from you anyway. So there is a position here, which is not a position that Aboriginal people can defend. So when people talk about native title rights, what we need to understand that it's not a right in the sense of you, you're not, it's not a basic human right. It's not a basic right protecting country. It's a form of legislation that can coerce people into agreements that they would prefer not to make. So it entraps Aboriginal people in a situation which I would suggest there, there is no way out. There is no win for Aboriginal people in regard to the, the, um, the, the power of native title legislation. The other thing that this links very strongly to, and I think very closely to, is um, what in the film there's a there's a wonderful interview with with in Queensland with three Aboriginal um, women, remarkable elders. That just listening to them talk, I was awestruck by the power and the dignity of these women and 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 their voices. But one of the things that comes out in that, and one of the women, you know, she talks about the fact that she was part of a community that had signed over a, a, a lease agreement with a mining company and now regretted it very deeply. Now, there are two things that, that are at play. Well, there are more than two things that are at play there. And one is that the, the when Aboriginal people are confronted by a mining agreement, there is a often a discussion about what that will bring to a community. So there is a discussion about jobs, education, health services, et cetera. And these are basic services that these communities do not have, or they will have at a very basic level. And then what they're being told, if you allow this mining lease to go ahead, not only will we bring education and jobs to your community, yeah, you'll get something that you never had before, which is a running toilet. We'll give you decent sewerage. Now, that itself, I want to talk about the, the hypocrisy of that in a moment. But if you imagine as a community, as a family, that you don't have access to basic facilities, you don't have jobs for your children, you don't have proper education standards for your children, and then someone says, we can give you all of these things, again, you're weighing that up against the protection of your country. And... While people understand the protection of country is paramount, in the immediate sense, it's very hard to make a decision when you think you may be able to benefit your family and community because of these so-called services that are promised to you. But as we know in the film, several things occur. We know that in the case that there were communities who are getting so-called um, royalties from mining, which amount to $50 a year. I mean, $50 a year in some of the places that people have to shop in the Northern Territory wouldn't buy you more than a couple of you know liters of milk and a few other you know basic goods. We know that the jobs that are promised, as these three elders talk about, never eventuated. So the promises that mining companies make to Aboriginal people often fall short, are often non-existent, are often available for the short term. But I, I would like people to think about this in a much more basic way. I want you to imagine this that. These Aboriginal people who own land, their land that has been stolen from them or is under threat of theft, they live in circumstances of sometimes abject material poverty. In other words, you, know, you look at the conditions in, in one of these scenes here when after a cyclone, the most basic um, you know, accommodation is not even repaired, where people are living in very desperate conditions. And then to get the most basic facilities, you have to sign away the protection of your country. Now, to think about that, 
these people are Australian citizens. We are all supposed to be Australian citizens. And what Aboriginal people on country face is that they are not able to be guaranteed basic services that we should all take as a human right, that we should all take for granted unless they are willing to sign away the protection of country. And that is no different than any of us here living, say, in the city in Melbourne or any other major city in Australia. If we were to, um, you know, we want our, our toilet repaired and a, a plumber comes around and he says, OK, I can repair your toilet, but if you want a running toilet and you want your hot and cold running water, if you want your kids to go to school and get basic education, you have to sign this piece of paper which will allow a mining company to come and dig up your backyard. Now, as ludicrous as that sounds, that's a shocking imposition that these people face, that they cannot be guaranteed basic human rights unless, in fact, their human rights are subject to abuse. So either way, if they get these basic facilities, the, other, the cost of that is to lose the right to country as Indigenous people or the right to control of country as Indigenous people. So it's a shocking injustice a shocking injustice when you consider what is already what these communities have already been subject to. So what I want to say in closing is, is just to close with two really important points. I would like people to get away from the notion of mining companies and their relationship to protect so-called sacred sites. We understand, of course, that sacred sites need to be protected. And we know um, in recent months, we've heard of the shocking cases of a mining company like Rio Tinto destroying very, very important sacred sites. And we know that mining companies have a long history of destroying sacred sites of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. One of the things about fracking that we need to understand and thinking about um, the water table under country in the ground is that the notion that a mining company can come into a community and, and talk, even talk about protecting sacred sites should be seen as a complete anathema because what we're talking about is the whole of country being affected by this form of mining. The whole of country being poisoned by this form of mining. Once you poison the waterways of any community, it doesn't matter what, whether you're protecting a so-called sacred site, you're destroying people's access to water, you're destroying country at a wholesale level. So we need to stop mining companies getting away the notion that it can go into communities to extract gas and they can do it in relationship to protecting country because it can't. And the final thing I wanna say is in regard to what I've learned, I think from doing the climate justice work I've been doing for several years, that is reinforced through Rachel's remarkable film and through the voices of the people who um, speak to us in this film is that we need a fundamental philosophical change in this country if we're ever to protect country, if we're ever to deal with climate change in a comprehensive way, it's pretty simple. We have to defer to country, we have to defer to the authority of country, and we have to defer to the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living on country. Their authority has to be upheld. And I would say that listening to the voices in this film, I was deeply, deeply moved by the power of those voices. And when you hear people talk about whether it be a protest on a bridge, whether it be taking people out to, to a waterway and, and engaging in ceremony, whether it be listening to three older Aboriginal women, you know, sitting on a couch um, talking about the history of mining company abuses on their country. These are the voices that we must give authority to if we're going to ever protect country in the way that we, we should do. So I just want to finally thank Rachel for making the film. I think it's very inspiring and I think it will be very influential in shifting the thinking of a lot of people. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to try and follow on. Um, it's really wonderful that you were able to um, respond to the film and, and, you know, speak for it in NAM. Um, I don't have so many connections to NAM and I'm really um, conscious of, you know, like how uh, ongoing the kind of urban story of pan-Aboriginal, you know, rights is as a conversation that crosses country. So I think, um, you know, there's so much there um, in the work that you're doing um, that connects to uh, 
the, you know, the important connections that we can make, not just um, about the present tense, but, you know, refusing the erasure of all the work that you've done in previous decades as well, which I think um, is part of the work I was trying to um, point to um, in some of the research that I do for kind of settler run art spaces. Um, I'm at the moment, I'm in, in the engine on um, younger and terrible country. And, and um, uh, I'm really grateful for the activism that's happening here on some of these issues. Uh, I wanted, to, I'm just going to talk a bit about how gas appears as, as such a neocolonial formation, but also just slips through um, urban consciousness so quickly. Um, and then I'm going to just mention um, something about the timing of getting these, getting these films out, because uh, the timing is really important. And um, a little bit to demystify the making of the film, because I think that's really important, you know, how I ended up making this film in the context of, you know, how much amazing Indigenous-led activism is happening around this issue, climate change, etc. Um, and then I'll just leave with some points, I think, which also reinforce this um, emphasis on thinking, because I think um, yeah, I really, um, I really appreciate that comment about what contribution um, non-Indigenous people need to be making to kind of deconstruct the, their educations, basically. Um, so I'll just share some slides. Great. Okay, so um, I guess it's into. Um, to, to kind of think about the kind of media space that we are in, right? So there's been recent attention again to the um, situation of media ownership in this country. Um, uh, when I, one of the reasons I started this research is because there was no conversation, not just putting indigenous voices on the table to be in the early fracking documentaries, but actually there was no constant conversation about the continuity of land dispossession um, in, in some of the most um, actively defended country in Western Queensland when this, frac when this industry first came there. Um, if you look at the first, um, one of the first bigger fracking documentaries, Frackman, there's a line in that film where he says, that, um, the main character says, this is the worst thing to happen in Australia since the asbestos disaster. And I, and I really kind of hooked into that as, you know, this kind of total erasure at the level of the whiteness of the environment movement in a moment when the environment movement was, you know, was really, really reorganizing around this industry because it's so it's so sloppy in how it fractures country that it, it reorganizes political imagination among white people and you know it crosses class differences but there's hardly there was hardly any conversation amongst those um, you know Western Queensland activists at that time about the land that they're on and the history of that country and the ongoingness you know of the indigenous presence on that country so um, I was living in Gladstone, I grew up there, um, my family uh, on my father's side were union organisers and so, um, you know, my contribution I, I kind of perceived at that time partly was just about documenting the scale of the, of the remediation of the landscape that was happening so quickly, the harbour um, was really ruined by the dredging project to make way for the industry. Um, um, but also um, because of native title, you know, the women in the film, the Gurren Gurren aunties, um, they weren't able to speak up at the time that they were negotiating those agreements. So, so their silence in media space was really palpable. And, um, you know, the connectivity uh, of, you know, those, those really high paying mining jobs to the destruction of other people's country, um, they were really conscious of. Um, and these industries kind of entangle, you know, uh, a really complex, well, it's not that complex, but it's really, um, you know, vastly spread in terms of what, uh, how they kind of massage um, the presence and the reality and productivity of this kind of industry against um, an understanding of its toxicity and its coloniality. So um, you can see the kind of propaganda that comes out at that time when there was no, um, uh, no Indigenous voices in Queensland media at that time. Obviously, it's 100% Murdoch, so that's not an accident. Um, I, pre I professionalized as a curator of, of installation um, practices uh, in at the State Museum, and I really, I really feel like I was studying the gas industry as a kind of large-scale corporate um, installation project. Um, it's not an accident um, that it was uh, easily installed in Queensland precisely because of the weakness of land rights in Queensland. 
And, um, you know, when I teach internationally to my art students, I make a point of saying that contemporary art, you know, was declared prematurely arrived in Australia, you know, in the context of a, of a land rights movement that had only just um, uh, nationalised um, India space at that time. And, um, you know, the infrastructures of artistic freedom that we have that are based on still, I think, for a lot of settler art schools that are based on this idea of European freedom, you know, are fully bound up with the un unfreedom um, of uh, people still defending land. And so, you know, that's the, prof that's the professional kind of infrastructure that we operate in. And so my personal opinion, which is not only mine, is that um, we have a responsibility to not just promote Aboriginal art practices, but to talk about what's actually happening in the country that those practices um, uh, come from and to take some responsibility in our cultural institutional work and outside of our paid jobs for thinking about, you know, if that is the kind of justice project that we are aesthetically invested in, well, how does that materially translate into other kinds of practices, including redistributing labour and value to sites that need to be defended? Um, a study came out recently that said there's something like 19 different ecosystems, local ecosystems um, threatened by collapse in this country alone um, in the next 20 years. And I think, uh, you know, those kinds of um, those kinds of things that seem like news to settlers, that's not news to, you know, our Indigenous colleagues, but there is, you know, there are increasingly questions about the contradictions, I think, of our, of our professionalism that I think need to be talked about more broadly. So for me, I think what, what our us do have, and I think what um, aesthetic training does teach you is a kind of sensitivity to media. Um, and I think um, in this case, I was quite sensitive to the artfulness of the corporate mediation of these kinds of um, investment projects. And if we're look, thinking about how land is abstracted away, you know, from Indigenous governance and from, you know, the palpable power of, of the people in the film, um, you know, there's three at least three kind of operative ways in which that happens. And one of them is the ongoingness of the kind of terra nullius erasure of history, Aboriginal history and land management. The second is private property, um, which my early kind of film um, thought to contribute to thinking about this kind of contemporary um, space from a distance, because I was in Europe and, and um, trying to make kind of more research-based film at, in, a, in a film before this one. And then, um, what I think settlers could do a lot more of is thinking about the, the, the amount of cultural work that corporations do in this country and what we think about um, the power of that cultural work. Um, these things become more apparent once you see, um, you know, some of the some of these supposed kind of artistic renditions that um, corporations will publish when they're trying to license these um, license these projects, not just uh, in courts of law, but in newspapers and in, you know, in local communities. So on the left hand side, there's a kind of image of, you know, private property combined with a mining plan um, that's supposed to show how clean, you know, the industry is in, in tapping through the groundwater and just producing minor earthquakes and just affecting that one slab of land. Obviously, the connectivity of that land, you know, is the, is the reality. Um, but the reverse um, is the surrealism. On the right hand side, that's actually an image that was used by one of the mining companies in Gladstone to explain um, the spacing of its infrastructure. And what you'll notice is at this time, the, 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 that export infrastructure in Gladstone was actually built to um, export uh, gas from up to 60,000 wells in Western Queensland. And you'll see only one spot there is registered for gas well so you know that the, the complete anti-empiricism and anti-science of these kinds of um, visual projects is really can be quite remarkable and it's something that we can kind of intervene in I guess. For more um, on the corporate history of um, uh, you know the relationship of corporate Australia to the destruction of land rights and its turning of land rights into native title I would recommend among all of the work of of people like Gary Foley and the, um, you know that land rights archive. In addition to that, people who study corporate Australia are quite useful. So this book on the right hand side, Lindy Nolan, um, has kind of gone through and looked at you know how many kind of re reconciliation projects and and this kind of thing come out of the invention of corporate Australia. It's not an accident. Um, 
I mean, she starts in, in that book with the fact that, you know, the Business Council of Australia was actually a dream of the head of Rio Tinto. And so, um, you know, and at that time, you know, the corporations were quite terrified that, that about the land rights movement and they organised what was essentially a union of corporations to push back against, you know, the relationship of the unions to the land rights movement. Um, so I, um, I was invited based on the pre previous work that I'd done on the gas and it's, um, it's uh, the whiteness of the environment movement to, to come to this meeting in, in um, Catherine um, in 2018 that, were, that followed the lifting of the moratorium on, on anti-fracking and it's called Stories from the Frontline and some of the people in the film I met um, at that event uh, and I also met, you know, people from the Protect Country Alliance at that event, and that was, I guess, my connection um, to the communities. I didn't actually pick any of the speakers in the film. I think that's important to say, like, they were actually people that were already speaking up for their country to many, many journalists, and, well, not enough journalists, but some journalists, um, and, you know, have the authority in their communities, and so I really just kind of um, was speaking to people that were pointed to me as who the people were that I should be speaking to. And um, the bottom there, I mean, I wanted to include this image because it gives you an idea of the sonography of power that went into um, the Northern Territory scientific inquiry into hydraulic fracturing. Um, it wasn't the first inquiry, but it was the one, um, you know, it's the most recent one that 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 went through all the rigmarole of, of you know, a supposedly democratic inquiry project. Uh, no Aboriginal people are obviously on the board of the inquiry. Um, importantly, there was very minimal um, translation, transla translators available for people to um, testify against the industry in their own languages. And there were a lot of artists um, and, um, you know, important land rights activists involved in turning up to the inquiry and, and, and really pointing to the performativity of it. And the fact that they're, you know, even though they're sitting in the room, the way that their knowledge was being understood, you know, was basically blocking the transmission of their authority, basically. Um, and on the top right hand side, you can see, um, you know, this, this is not a new investment um, imagination. This is a colonial heritage from the 19th century uh, that we know from, you know, from old, old fictitious maps that dreamed of a you know, of a vast array of water at the centre of the country that is actually underground. Um, what's interesting about that is it, it completely um, coincides with the um, analyses of the um, industry and energy market. Um, the gas led recovery, I've got images here. Yeah, the gas led recovery, um, prioritised as, as um, possibly the only major economic response to COVID, um, you know, really, uh, as well as the, the obvious point that it's stacked by a gas industry um, professionals. Uh, if you actually do the math on it, as many um, industry people have, um, it, it's, uh, it actually doesn't make sense. If you were, if you're only wanting to profit from that space and had absolutely no regard for any people that live there, uh, it, there's still, you know, it's such a great risk um, that the, the federal government is basically trying to um, to prop up this industry that uh, that many um, oil companies around the world are pulling out of at the same time. So, um, you know, the coloniality of power is key to these, you know, federal leaders' investment in actually producing um, this kind of scale of destruction. I would say. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm really moving quite quickly through these slides, but I think that that that's an, an important point to point out. So the film, um, if you haven't seen it yet, it's been showing, um, we've curated it to five venues around Australia and at each location, um, First Nations speakers um, are speaking to the film um, in those places. Uh, you can see the first um, three, um, the first three discussions already online at the Institute of Modern Art. And there's some, ama some amazing responses um, of artists and activists and including from the film, but also from speed and from um, uh, you know from the land rights movement within art, you know Australian art speaking up there to the, to the film and the conditions that it's kind of articulating. Uh, my contribution in the in the exhibition space, which is also coming out of that 
um, literacy and corporate history is about pointing to the major issue of the disconnection of land rights from water rights. So not many people know this, but John Howard made sure that even in the weakness of native title uh, and in time with corporate interest in, this, in, in separating um, property rights in land from property rights in water to create a private water market in this country based on um, ideas that were brought here by US um, corporate consultancies in the very early 1980s. Based on that interest, um, Howard made sure to disconnect Indigenous water rights from Indigenous land rights and native title rights. So even if people do win back their land, you know, as you see in the film, like um, Ray is sitting at the heart of the of Walkoff country, you know, which is such a historic space for the achievement of land rights in the Northern Territory. He doesn't have native title. Uh, sorry, he has native title, which means he can't say native mining. Um, but even if he had land rights, um, he he can't comment on the water rights connected to that land because that severance has already been made, um, you know, much earlier than now. Um, the film, you know, I don't think I would have been able to make this film with, uh, you know, predominantly Australian funding. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that. I've been away for a while and being away and seeing how this situation compares to what's happening in other countries was helpful for thinking about coming back and, and kind of, you know, speaking to the right people and also, um, you know, making that, making um, some of those footnotes, making sure they make sense to an international audience that really already is invested in, in Indigenous rights in a general sense, but don't necessarily know the full kind of history of struggle that's local to those places and to, um, you know, the kind of pan aboriginal story um, that continues needing to be told. And um, one of the most interesting and important things I think we did the Hugh um, did our first international talk to a bunch of academics that, was, that were assembling as part of a conference um, called Extractive Matters at Arts Catalyst. And that was actually bringing together artists and activists working between North and South who were um, thinking about um, how arts can, you know, um, how these collaborations can work tactically better together, but also how they can understand, you know, how the North and how kind of European sort of continues to affect very local um, struggles and situations on the ground of country, you know, where people live. So, that, so we did a tour with the London Mining Network who turned up to share how hold, hold the meetings at all of those famous Australian mining companies that are right in the middle of the city next door to Buckingham Palace. And we got that kind of, um, you know, like local corporate um, uh, feel for how connected, you know, that kind of history of empire remains to the struggles that are, that are happening now. And we met some really amazing people that turn up day to day um, to those shareholder meetings. Just to lend, uh, end on a um, more positive note and also to correct some of the things that have happened since the film um, uh, has ended. Um, the Bachelor people in Wide Bay area have been the first in the country to um, uh, an old, old gas license is based on the um, free prior informed consent laws that are in UNDRIP that um, I miss uh, Professor Watson talks about as being a kind of um, weak protection that was installed in 2007. Um, Gemma now works one day a week for Lock the Gate and is making sure there's more Indigenous presence in Queensland in that, in that NGO. Um, and um, the court case that I didn't film Sorry, yeah, the, the action that I didn't film um, when I was in the Antica that wasn't there. And I, I feel weird about putting activism in the film that I wasn't part of, right? So, but this was such an important um, gesture and such a provocative, um, rational response to the situation in the NT, the Boral Alert community um, came together and um, produced this action that was, they went and drilled the lawns of the Parliament House and um, they'd been held up in the court for quite some time. Um, and it was just um, decided on recently by a judge who gave a very positive response um, about uh, in terms of the, the rationality of the gesture in relationship to minimal, um, minimal other routes of defense of country, uh, but also the, the obvious um, climate case for um, not fracking at NT. So the, um, the scientific inquiry, as well as um, many other critiques that you could have of it, climate change wasn't actually um, a part of the kind of term 
terms of reference to that scientific inquiry, even though uh, the plan to frack DMT uh, would release six times the emissions of the current uh, emissions of the Northern Territory. Finally, I just wanted to say um, in the film, there's a map there of current gas um, approvals and um, it's a really horrifying image, I think, um, but I put it there because I think people, particularly in the inner city, don't necessarily know how much country is at threat. Um, but I also want to say, I am really careful to say that the, you know, these yellow, lighter yellow marks, yes, fracking has been approved in those places, but it definitely hasn't happened in many of them. So, uh, you know, a lot of capital from the federal government um, and a lot of confidence from the mining companies is required to actually uh, make that happen. And until that moment, um, you know, there's a lot of contingency um, politically and economically around the possibility of those spaces being fracked. So um, the, the darker green um, tidal sections there, um, their submissions by mining companies to frack that country, as you can see, it was a free for all in the Northern Territory until about 2016. In some of those places, there's not even gas in those places. So it, it makes it more clear how easy it is to apply, you know, to toxify the land, but actually um, definitely that you know that's not a kind of fatalistic image it's the image that is, is being refused at the level of its realism and there's no way that that amount, that amount of fracking will happen but it, but it's going to be dependent on how many people resist it and how many people support those frontline communities and resources from frontline communities um, who are really um, you know um, staring down the barrel of, of a whole lot of stupidity at the moment um, <laughs> that was my thinking otherwise slide uh, we, I'm happy to kind of talk about that or, or add it to the um, to the Zoom um, publication. Um, if you're interested in um, contributing to these kinds of um, uh, projects that are protecting country in this area, um, I would point you to um, these groups. Uh, uh, the group that I guess um, I continue to be in conversation with is the Project Country Alliance and the Central Australian Frack Free Alliance. Um, SEED has just become fully independent, which is amazing, and you should definitely uh, be prioritising the work that they're doing in NT with young people organising, which is really amazing work. Get Up has also been doing good work around elections. Um, I wanted to put in there the Moree Ecological Holistic Information Centre on Facebook. Um, that's a group of people that are publishing um, the current campaign for the uh, village of forest. And, um, you know, the, the situation in the NT, Western Australia, I'm not an expert in, I'd recommend you take a look at it. But there's a lot happening in terms of things that need to be refused right now. And under the cover of this kind of generalized COVID story, there hasn't been so much attention um, on that. And um, for ongoing coverage, I've put some, some kind of journalism links there of the people that are debunking, um, you know, the government narratives of how um, how uh, realistic it is to kind of produce these new mining infrastructures. Um, and yeah, I guess, um, Helen, I'd love for you to um, engage in any questions there. But yeah, thanks so much for having us. The film will, go, the film will launch online in time with its um, Monash, um, other Monash events. So we're gonna be ringing up Ray Dixon from um, the Marlinger community who appears in the middle of the film talking about the interconnection of water. And then we're gonna go back to UNSW and connect um, Q to um, this, um, the campaign from the pillager. And then we're going to end in um, Gladstone with the growing, growing aunties talking about um, the film experience for them. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. Um, well, thanks, Tony, first of all, for sketching for us, the longer history of the Indigenous struggle for climate justice uh, in this country and to Rachel for yeah. um, some of the decision making around the film and how you arrived at the content matter. I know we um, don't have heaps of time, but I suppose I wanted to throw an image back to both of you that really resonated for me watching the film, which was the um, image of the white ant who comes into a community and picks away at one person and not only through this process sort of gets the immediate gratification of the mining contract sign and get in there and get the minerals or the gas, but um, also winnows away at the possibility for sort of um, future collective action, I guess, by um, creating those rifts in, in community and thinking also about, Rachel, you mentioning your 
um, ancestors in Gladstone and their involvement with the um, union movement. So I just was wondering, and also I guess in the film you repeat this image with the white ant twice by replaying it to the three elders um, sitting on their couch. So I don't know. That was the most one of the most resonant images to me. If either of you like to comment to it, comment on it, I should say. Well, I, I would because I think that you know clearly when when that um, when they're referring to that um, idea, they're um, referring to individual Aboriginal people um, as it could, you know as much as it could be a white fella who gets a job or who works for a mining company or, or who liaises between mining companies and communities. I think it's I think it's fairly simple. Is that um, I can imagine the excitement of being given that opportunity, <laughs> but what it really points to is that no individual should be given any coercive authority um, in regard to collective decisions that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people need to make. And um, it's clear of um, one of the tactics of mining companies, and we know this has been the case in regard to the Adani mine and the impact on the Wangan and Jay Galindo people is that you, you need to find an Aboriginal voice that you can either work with, manipulate, coerce, strategically um, engage with that disenfranchise and disempowers whole communities so that um, it goes back to I think the same philosophy that was talked about in this film in regard to the difference between land rights and native title acts or native title legislation is that if you genuinely believe, believe in the autonomy and authority of Aboriginal nations to control our country then all decisions have to be um, proper cultural collective decisions and there is no place for individuals to make decisions on behalf of communities. It's, it's, it's that simple. And I think that one of the, the strategic reasons for this, and there are many, is that it allows for the so-called streamlining of decision making. And we know that um, communities need proper time to do proper consultation within the sort of parameters of cultural practice in their own communities and I think it's shocking the way that we we forget that for any community or nation to make a decision on how their country is used or not used or how they engage with non-Aboriginal people in regard to the protection of country these are decisions that take a lot of time they take a lot of consultation and if you're not prepared to do that you shouldn't be even engaging with communities and I think it would be obvious that mining companies and governments know that if they engage with communities and nations in a full and proper cultural way that very different decisions would be made so these you know bureau, bureau, bureaucratic institutionalized forms of engagement are really deceptive and um, really disempower people so rather than thinking maybe about the individual white hand it's the process or the the superstructure that's put in place to allow this to happen which has to be dismantled because yeah i think it's it's not, it's understandable how an individual could be sucked into this role, you know, I can understand that, that it's the, the, the manipulation around that, which I think is much more damage. Mm. Yeah, totally. I mean, growing up in Gladstone, you know, that, that town, um, you know, people uh, make fun of it as a space. It's, I found it kind of interesting that it was quite an unmournable space in, in, in media. Like there's no, there's, you'll never see a film about the destruction of Gladstone Harbour because it was already considered the most industry friendly town in Australia before the gas station came there. Um, what I was going to say about that, I mean, that, that kind of argument, I mean, particularly, particularly amongst settlers who don't know enough about what's going on and don't want to have an opinion until they know more. I think that's when it also gets really dangerous because they'll, they'll circulate this idea that we can't comment on these practices because some Aboriginal people will benefit, you know, in a minor way financially from them. And it's that kind of argument that, um, you know, I think needs, I mean, obviously it needs to be refused, but it's also the reason why I'm comfortable um, talking about uh, uh, the place where I grew up, which I care about. It's not that I, that I want to demolish it, you know, it's kind of, ethical location or whatever um, is precisely because you know some many of my Aboriginal um, friends that I went to high school with are getting like, buying their first houses with mining industry money you know like in the history of their families there's no wealth accumulation um, except for whatever happens with industry in that town and um, 
whatever happens with the industry in that town is always hooked to one company which has a set of practices that are more or less um, symbolically engaged with Aboriginal people. And so the critique can't happen through that space because of, you know, the economic case for it. Um, but, you know, like I was at a dinner the other the night, um, an art dinner, and, and I was sitting next to a woman and she said to me that she was, um, you know, she watched Andrew Forrest's lawyer lectures and was convinced by his argument for Indigenous development. And we've been sold that image. And I think we've been sold that image also in art space, you know, the, the whole happy marriage of art, you know, uh, remote community art, um, uh, art centres just sitting right next to a mine and these things being a solution to, you know, Aboriginal protection of country. And obviously it's insane, but but I think um, it's, it's, it's interesting how many layers that we need to unpack that to understand that basically we need to be more literate in how, in how uh, capitalism actually works in order to have, you know, a kind of solidarity relationship with people in all of the spaces of settler colonial society, right? So I have no comment on any Abri Aboriginal person who want, wants to take any money from any art exhibition or any corporate sponsored thing or any mining project. The point is like, how does it happen? Where, where do we position ourselves in it? And who, like, where do we put our attention um, and, and our kind of resourcing energies, I guess. Um, thank you both so much. I think we have to uh, stop the conversation now or rather put it on pause until next week where we continue the chat um, in Marta Gallery. Uh, everyone, uh, keep an eye out on the MAMA website for the link to infractions, which we will um, put up there shortly. And um, thank you very much for tuning in. <laughs>